Amen. Another wonderful time in the presence of God. Amen. Oh, wow. It's like a breath of fresh air in God's presence. It's so good. How many of you guys have been enjoying this series that we're on, uh, on the Ten Commandments? Yeah, it's been a good couple of weeks so far. Uh, this week we're on uh, number two, and we have, I guess we have eight more after this. I've been really, I've been really enjoying, uh, I've really been enjoying um, studying this out and uh, talking with some of the other uh, pastors and leaders and some of the things that we're talking about, and it's been really eye-opening and it's been really interesting. It's been a lot of uh, revelation, I guess you could say, of the purpose that God has for the Ten Commandments in our lives today. And I'm just going to read. I'm going to read from uh, our text in the Scripture, Exodus 20, verses 1 to 17. I'm not going to read all of them, but I'm gonna, just going to read the first couple of verses. Um, we talked in the first week about why, what's the purpose of the Ten Commandments? And it's, we talked about it, how it's for relationship, our relationship with God and our relationship with others. It's not, the Ten Commandments were not given by God to redeem us, to set us free from sin, to save our souls. But because that has happened already, God lays out this plan for us, you do these things and we'll have good relationship. You'll have good relationship with God and you'll have good relationship with others. And so we see in Exodus chapter 20, in the very beginning, God, it says, Then God spoke all these words. This is God giving the Ten Commandments to the Israelites. In verse 2 it says, I am the Lord your God. Even before he says one command, but even before he says do this, don't do that, he says, this is who I am. I'm your God. It's that relationship piece right from the very beginning. I am the Lord, your God. This is, who you, this is who I am. This is who you are. And this is how we're connected in relationship. I am the Lord, your God. I am the one who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. That word slavery is very, very important. God brought the Israelites, out of Egypt. In Egypt, they were slaves. They had no freedom. They had to do everything that the Egyptians told them to do. You make bricks, you use this hay, and then they said, okay, we're not going to give you any hay, you got to go find your own. So they were slaves back then. They didn't have any freedom to say, nope, nope, I'm not going to do that. They were slaves. They didn't have a choice. They had to do these things. But God says, I brought you out of that place. I redeemed you. I did the miracles. I did the ten plagues. I opened up the sea. I made the way for you. I killed all of your enemies in the sea. Now you have freedom. So the God was establishing right from the very beginning. This is who I am. This is the relationship that we have. Same is true with us. God redeems us. It's not something that we do. It's something that he has already done on the cross. He says, this is the way. He made the way. He opened up the sea for us. Now we can be free. We're not slaves to sin anymore. We have freedom. But God says, okay, now let's continue in a good relationship. Let's have a good, close relationship together. So the same thing God has done for the Israelites, he does for us as well. In verse 3, it says, do not have any other gods besides me. We were talking about this one last week. God doesn't share the room with anybody. He is the only God. It's not God is number one, and then you can have God's number two, three, four, five, and six. No, it's not that way at all. God says, I am the God, no other gods. Full stop, period. No comma and a little bit more afterwards. It's, I am the Lord your God. Do not have any other gods. That's it. Just me. God wants all of our hearts. He doesn't come just saying, all right, I'll have the first hour of every day. And then you can do whatever you want with the rest of your life. No. God wants to be in, in every single piece of our life. When we're with our family, 
God wants to be the center of your family. When you're at work, God wants to be the center of your work. When you are having fun and doing recreational things that you like to do, God wants to be the center of that. God wants to be your every breath, your every heartbeat, every part of your life, God wants. Because he created us and he put his spirit within us. Today we're going to look at the third commandment, okay? Sorry, not the third commandment, second commandment. Thank you. So, I think I have a slide up there. We already read this one, though. It was Exodus 20, verse 3. Can we put the first one up there? Yeah, you shall have no other gods before me. So that was the first one. All right? When God was bringing the Israelites out of Egypt, Egypt was a land of many, many gods. You have the God of the sun. You have the God of the river. You have the God of the cows. You have the God of this God and that God and that God. So many different gods. And if you look at the plagues that God did to free the Israelites, it was a judgment on most of their main gods. But God was bringing the Israelites out of Egypt, out of a place of many, many gods. And his plan is to bring them into the land of Canaan, another place of many, many gods. So God's saying, I am the only one. And then he says, do not make any idols for yourself. The place where they left and the place where they were going was unlike the way that God wanted them to live. God says, don't live like the Egyptians. Don't live like the Canaanites. Live with me. I am your God. Let's read in Psalms 106, verse 37. It says, they sacrifice their sons and their daughters to the demons. This is what one of the things that they did in their sacrifices to Baal, is that they would offer their sons and daughters, their children, to these idols. And this was the, this was the practice of some of the uh, nations where the Israelites were going into. Let's read another verse in Deuteronomy 18, verses 9 to 10. God says, When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. There shall not be found any among you, anyone who burns his son or daughter as an offering, anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens or a sorcerer. This is the place. This is the nation. This is the practice of the people that Israel was going into. God says, don't do any of these things. Don't live like these people. This is what they do. Don't do anything like that. So God was bringing them out of a place of many, many gods, going into a place where there were many, many gods. I want to show a quick video to you. Now, this is a video that some people took in Saudi Arabia, and it's part of a, a video called The Mountain of Fire. And it's some Christian explorers who went and they think they found, they're pretty sure, pretty certain that they found the original Mount Sinai in Saudi Arabia. But this part is where they believe that Aaron and the Israelites put the golden altar on top, or, or sorry, the golden calf on top of an altar. And I want you to see all of the carvings that were on these rocks. Okay? So remember, this is not in Egypt, but, but what you'll see is things that look like the Egyptian gods. Can we go ahead and play that video? You guys ready? It's just a couple minutes long here. So that's Exodus 32, verse 4. Do we have audio with this? I think there's audio here, too. Do we have any sound? Another major event by Mount Sinai is the incident with the golden calf. While Moses is up on Mount Sinai, some of his followers begin worshiping a golden calf. They place it up on a stand and begin worshiping around it, and they set up an altar in front of it. When Moses comes down from Mount Sinai, he destroys the golden calf and sprinkles its remains into the river that comes down from the mountain. 
Here, in front of the mountain, we have the remains of what may have been that golden calf worship site. Now behind me in this fenced in archeological site that the Saudis are protecting, you see both a stand with many petroglyphs of cows and people worshiping cows, as well as a structure that is slightly lifted that may be the altar in front of the golden calf stand. There's a sign in Arabic and English warning intruders against going into the area. The local tradition that this is where the golden calf was is so strong that if you approach it, you'll be suspected of searching for gold. According to the Bible, the worshipers of the golden calf say, these are your gods, O Israel. This verse indicates that there are multiple depictions of bulls as the Israelites are worshiping the golden calf. On the top of the stand where the golden calf would have been placed, there is a circular indent where the rock has been worn down. It's speculated that this is where Moses grounded the golden calf into powder. After Moses destroys the golden calf, 3,000 of the golden calf worshippers are killed, so there must be a spot where thousands of people were buried. About four miles from this site, there's a massive ancient graveyard. It appears to be a mass burial site where the graves were dug all at once. It's located just outside the plain where the Israelites would have camped, so it's exactly where it should be if this is where that story took place. Here too, the Saudis have a sign identifying it as an archaeological site, and it's patrolled by police. All right, the lights back on, please. So we see that this is quite likely. I mean, there's nobody who was there at the time to say, yes, this is exactly the spot. But this is quite likely the place where the Israelites went to Mount Sinai. Moses spent the 40 days up on the mountain, and all of the Israelites said, okay, Aaron, look, we need a, we need a god. And so what did they do? They went back to the gods of the Egyptians. There was one god. The name of the, the, name of the god was uh, Heroth, and it was in the shape of a cow. And it, if you compare those carvings in the stone that we just saw in that video with a lot of the carvings that you see in Egypt, very, very similar. It looks almost exactly the same. But it's not in Egypt. This is in Saudi Arabia. And so the question is, how did those things get there? And it was during that time. It was not just the one golden calf, but if they carved everything in there, then they would say, these are the gods that led you out of Egypt. So God is very specific in his command. God is very specific. Don't make, any, don't make an image and don't make any likeness of anything that is in heaven above. So God didn't want them worshiping these images and these likenesses. God doesn't want to share his worship with anybody. He is the one true God. Let's read in Exodus uh, chapter 20, verses 4 to 6. It says, You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness. Okay, remember those two words, image and likeness. Make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me. Verse 6. But showing steadfast love to thousands of those who keep me and keep my commandments. Amen. God is a good God, full of mercy and grace. God has appointed us for relationship with him and not for relationship with any other gods. God created us for relationship with him, not for us to serve other gods, not to make an image or a likeness of anything else, but to serve him and to worship him only. God doesn't want us to have impurity in our lives. This is my first point. There is danger in impurity. If I take a bottle of water, okay? It's sealed, it's pure, right? Take a drink, I can take a drink in confidence, right? But what would happen if I took just a little cap full? And what I did is I went to... Uh, one of these garbage trucks. Have you ever seen the full garbage trucks before? 
And that hangar's like, ew. Yeah, you can smell them. If you're driving down the street, it's like you can smell them like a kilometer away. They're way down there, but you can, oh, there it comes. You, can, you know you're going to catch up. The gross thing about it is with these garbage trucks, they always leak juice out of the back end of it. <laughs> That's disgusting, right? You're driving along, and then there's like a puddle, uh, a puddle, and then you're like, oh, man, I don't want to drive through that stuff. And then you catch up to the garbage truck, and it's constantly leaking. They always drive right, right here in front of the mall because the dump is way out that way. But what would happen, okay, if I went to the garbage truck, and I just took just a little cap full of that juice, right? Just a little cap full of that juice. First of all, I'd have, probably have to plug my nose so that I wouldn't smell anything. But if I took just a little cap full and then just poured it into my water like that, how many people would drink it if I did that? Any volunteers? You have no idea. Yeah, okay, justice, all right. Tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll do it, all right? You promised. You lifted your hand up. Yeah, you did. You said, I'm gonna, I'll do it. No one. No one would do that because there's danger in impurity, right? Even if you put just like half, one drop of that stuff in your water, you're going to be hurting for days and days and days if you drink this water, right? There is danger in impurity. God doesn't want us to be impure. He doesn't want even just a drop or just a little hint of impurity, not even a little, little tiny bit, because there is great danger in it. But when we're pure, when we're serving the one true God, the God of purity and holiness and righteousness, we can be confident. There's no danger in that. God wants us to live and to worship him in purity. I'm glad there's no garbage juice in my water. All right. Slide. Let's go to the next slide here. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Israel, during the time that Israel was traveling through the wilderness, Israel was the only nation that didn't have an idol or a God that they worshipped. Okay? Because our God's invisible. Okay? We can't see him. There's no image that would come close to capturing the goodness of our God. But what the other nations would do is they would take a piece of wood and they would start to carve it. Okay? They start to carve it. Maybe they make it in the shape of a cow or in the shape of a person or something like that. And they would make this image. And then what they would do is they would take it to the holy man or the temple or something, and they would pray, and they would ask the spirit to come and live in this image. Then they would take this god or this idol, and they would take it to the place where they wanted the blessing to be. So they would take it to their field, or they would take it to their house and put it up in their house for blessing and for protection. Maybe they would take it to the field so they can get good crops. Maybe they would go to this place or to that place. Maybe they took it to battle and war so they can have victory. They would ask their God, their spirit, to fill this image, and they would take it for the blessing wherever they went. And then they would worship it, and they would offer sacrifices to it and ask it to do the things that they wanted it to do. But God said, I don't want you to be like that. I don't want you to live like that. You are going to stand out among all the other nations because you're not going to have an image. You're not going to have a God to bow down to because I am the living God. I am greater than anything that you can make or create. The interesting, the interesting thing about it is that in Genesis chapter 1, God says, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. God himself took the dirt from the ground and made Adam. He formed a man. He breathed his spirit into man. You guys get the picture here? Not like... Not unlike the carved image, but God himself created us 
to be image bearers and to live in the likeness of God. He filled man with his spirit and said to man, I'm going to bless you so that you can be a blessing. So God put his image and his likeness in you, in us. And he doesn't want us to take this life that he has given us and bow down to another image, to bow down to another spirit, because we have the spirit of God living in us. We are the image bearers. We are the likeness of God, and we are the source of blessing in this world. Amen? This is why God doesn't want us bowing down. Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness. If you bow down to me and serve me, I will give you this and this and this and this and this. Jesus knew who he was. He's made in the image of God. He has the likeness of God and the spirit of God within him. He doesn't need to bow down to any image. He doesn't need to bow down to Satan to get anything at all because he knew who he was. God made man and women in his image. Let's, hear, let's read what it says in Genesis chapter 1. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens and over the livestock. Let's listen. Do not make an idol for yourself, whether in the shape of anything in the heavens above or on the earth below or in the waters under the earth. God gave us dominion over those things. He doesn't want us bowing down to images of those things. He gave us dominion over those things. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. This is God's plan for us. God did not mean for us to live a life of impurity, serving other idols, worshiping other gods, because God put his spirit within us. He created us in his image and in his likeness. Amen? God didn't want the people whom he put his image in to be bowing down to the image or likeness of another spirit. God doesn't want us depending on anything else or anybody else besides him. God doesn't want us seeking blessings for our crop in an idol or in a false god. God doesn't want us looking to something else for protection for our home or healing from disease or victory in battle. God wants us looking to him. We sang a lot of victorious songs this afternoon. You know, I raise a hallelujah, but then you go home and you worry about your finances and your bank account. Okay? No, we're going to depend on our Lord. He is the one. We're not going to think about all those other things that, oh, this and that. No, I'm going to put my hope in God. God didn't want the Israelites depending on any other God. You know, the gods all around them, uh, in Egypt and in Canaan, they had gods for personal gods. They had family gods. They had national gods. Even Joshua, later on, he said, he said, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your forefathers in, whom, in, in, in the land where you dwelled or the gods of the nations around you where you are going. But Joshua said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And that's the attitude that God wants us to have. No other gods. No other gods. Well, maybe you say, yeah, it's okay, Jason. I don't, I don't bow down to any idols. I just live my life. I go to work. I go home to my family. But sometimes there are other things in our lives that we depend on. Do you depend on your money for a sense of security? That's a good question. Do we depend on money for a sense of security? Do you look to your bank account 
to tell you whether you can feel at peace in the amount of money that you have or not. Okay? God didn't mean for us to live depending on a bank account. Okay? Here's another one. Do you depend on your fashion for a sense of importance? The things you have, the things you wear. Okay? Sometimes we do that. If I have the right shoes or if I have the right, you know, whatever, then I feel important. I feel like I fit in. Okay? Do you depend on your friends for a sense of belonging? Sometimes we can do that. God wants us to depend on him for all of these things. You know, even a lot of these gods that the Egypt or that the Egyptians served, they were gods of happiness and joy and this and that. Where do we get our happiness from? Do your emotions go up and down based on your bank account or based on your day if you had a good day or a bad day? Do you depend on your job for a sense of identity? Sometimes we can do that too. If I don't have a good job, then, you know, that's my identity is found in that. And so I know that we don't, maybe we don't bow down to idols, but what are the things that we're depending on in our lives? And the, this is just a few things, but what are the things that we're depending on in our lives? God doesn't want us bowing down, bowing our hearts, bowing our emotions, bowing our souls to any of these other things. God wants us to bow to him only. He put his image in you. He put his likeness in you. God has chosen you. God has created you. And he doesn't want to share your worship with anybody else. He doesn't want you to depend on anything else. God wants all of you. This command also has consequences and it has blessings as well. But listen to this. It says, Do not bow and worship to them and do not serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. God is jealous for you. He created you. He knows what's good for you. And he's jealous. Jealous in a good way because he knows what's best for you and he knows you're capable of love. And he wants all of your love. He wants your attention. He wants your dependence. He wants you. He wants your heart. Continues on. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the father's iniquity to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. God wants your attention. God wants your love. God wants your worship. In this version that we have here, it says, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation. God's punishment is not something that comes to dwell, comes to visit in order to correct us, to bring us back to the place of worship of him only. But it goes on in verse 6, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. The steadfast love talks about faithfulness and abiding presence of God. And that's what God wants in our worship. He wants us to be pure in our hearts. He wants us to depend on him only. He wants us to walk as the image and the likeness of God filled with his spirit everywhere we go, bringing that blessing. That means that we are connected with him all of the time. Someone who's filled with the spirit of God, like Jesus was, he was constantly connected to the Father. He was being led by the spirit and that's the way that God wants us to live as well. We're not doing things based out of fear, out of greed, out of hope, wrongly placed hope. But we're doing things based on this spirit 
that God wants to put inside each one of us. We are God's creation. We are the image and the likeness of God. And if you have not surrendered to God, if you have not asked Him to be the Lord of your life, maybe you're someone who has said, you know what, I've depended on too many wrong things for too long in my life and it's gotten me nowhere. It's, it's made me empty inside. The good news for you today is that Jesus died on the cross to take away all of our sins, to make us white as snow, to bring us back to the place we were created to be, the image and the likeness of God. And when we surrender to God, confess our sins and believe in our hearts, the Spirit of God comes and dwells within us. And we are a new creation. The old has passed away. The new has come. The new is God's original intent for us. It's the new life full of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, kindness, self-control. That's the life that the Spirit brings out from us. You were made to be a blessing. You were created in God's image. You were created in His likeness. And if you have not surrendered to the Lord, I would ask, come up to the front at the end and come talk with me or some of the other leaders. We would love to just talk to you about that. Pray together. Go into detail a little bit more and say, look, you know, this is the new life. We're called New Life Fellowship because this is such a central, integral part of our, our Christian life. But maybe you are a Christian already, but you're, you're living in a way where you're depending on the wrong things, and you're like, okay, God, you know, I, I can hear you. I can feel you touching my heart, convicting me. All right, then surrender to God and make a commitment. God, I'm going to live according to your spirit. I'm not going to live depending on this for my happiness or this for my se sense of self-importance or that for my security. All of those things I'm going to bring to God and I'm going to depend on the Lord Jesus Christ for all of those things. This is the way that God has created us to live. Amen? It's the good life. It's the, it's the God life. Amen? Why don't we all stand in honor of God? And just as we pray here at the end, I just want you to give thanks in your heart to God. And maybe, I think we all could probably do this. We could just make that fresh commitment to God. God, I want to live more from your spirit. Just a little bit more today. Then a little bit more tomorrow. I want that communion with you living that life that you have created me to live. So let's just spend a couple of minutes talking to God about that. And then I'll pray at the end. And then at the end, if anybody wants to come up and talk about surrendering their life to the Lord, we'd love to talk to you about that. So let's just spend a couple of minutes here just praying individually with the Lord.
Dear Heavenly Father, Creator, today we come to you and we say, God, we, we repent. We're sorry for all of the times when we have depended on things other than you for our sense of security or self-worth or happiness or joy. We've thought, if I only had this, then I'd be happy. Or if only this happened, then no, God, we're sorry for all that, God. God, you are the one who created us. You have put your image and your likeness within us. And you've given us your spirit. And you've blessed us, God, so that we can be a blessing. And God, you are the source of all of the things that we need and we look to, O oh God. And today we make a commitment, God, to turn our eyes from the things that we've depended on and turn our eyes to look only to you. Lord God, you are everything. Lord, you're our salvation, our hope, our life, our blessings. And we commit to you. We will not look to anything else to be our source of strength, but we look to you. And we live for you, and we live from your spirit, oh God. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for the reminder of who you are and who you have created us to be, God. We love you and we give you our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. If there's anybody who has any prayer requests, we, have our, we always have our leaders up front here.